I'm going to just briefly introduce our two speakers, and I'm sure there's a lot more that I could say, but um, they know a lot more than I do about this, and so I'd rather let y'all hear from them. Um, first of all, to uh, sort of introduce the topic and introduce our speaker, we have Julian Aguilar. He reports for the Texas Tribune. Yay, the Trib. His recent story, stories have covered the presidential elections, violence, immigration, and drug activity. Um, previously, he reported for the Rio Grande Guardian and the Laredo Morning Times. He has a bachelor's degree in English from the University of Texas and a master's degree in journalism from the University of North Texas. And this topic is close to his heart as he was born and raised in El Paso and has family in Mexico. Um, then uh, Dr. Ringo, Rico, <laughs> Ringo, Ringo, he's, you want to hear about his other, yeah, that's right. Later on, we'll have the, uh, the second part of this, uh, <laughs> Rico Ainsley. He is actually a, this is one of the things you learn here. If you come and you speak at the Future Forum, you do a really good job, we'll find an excuse to invite you back. Um, so this is actually his second time um, coming to, uh, gosh, it was maybe four or five years ago, uh, the first time. So anyway, he um, a whole different topic, also wonderful. Um, so we uh, we found another another excuse. He he has many many uh, hats he wears and many things he can do. And so we found something else uh, that he was knowledgeable on and asked him to come back and speak again. Um, he is a native of Mexico City and a U.S. citizen. At UT Austin, he is affiliated with the Lozano Long Institute for Latin American Studies, the Center for Mexican American Studies, and the American Studies Programs, where he's also a professor and fellow in the Department of Educational Psychology. For almost two decades, he has devoted himself to working in communities in Texas and Mexico that have experienced significant conflict and transformation, exploring broader questions about how communities function and how individuals and cultural groups live within them, Last year, he testified before Congress, and his new book, so y'all, I'll put this on your list, um, and we will talk to the book cluster about reading this later on once it comes out, The Fight to Save Juarez, Life in the Heart of Mexico's Drug War, will be published this spring. Um, so without further ado, um, I guess if you want to, Julian, come up and talk to us first. Good evening, y'all. I uh, appreciate you guys having me, and I appreciate being invited. Um, as was mentioned, this is a, a. I was asked, as, you know, if I could speak for five or ten minutes about Ciudad Juarez and El Paso, and I, I could probably speak for five or ten hours about it. Um, I was born and raised there, so I have family in Juarez. Um, it's it's difficult separating the journalist from from the person when you're writing about these issues. Um, we we try our best, um, but I, I think the first time I met Professor Ainsley was actually in uh, 2007. I was still in Laredo, and he was interested in what was going on in Nuevo Laredo at the time, um, specifically some stories that I had written about teenage uh, sicarios, hitmen, if you will, U.S. citizens that were paid uh, by then the Gulf Cartel to kill people on this side, getting into the spillover violence thing. And, um, so we, we chatted a little bit about that at, uh, at La Posada, I think, at the, you know, the fancy hotel in Laredo. Um, but it's, it's still close enough to where you, you look out the window and you want to see who's walking by, especially when you're talking about something like this. Months later, um, I would visit uh, El Paso on a, on a trip just to say hi to my folks, and uh, my mom and I were in Juarez. We have some properties in Juarez that haven't been rented out for a while, so we wanted to go check on them, uh, you know, see, see kind of how things were. This was early, middle part of 2008, if I remember correctly. In Juarez, you could tell something was just not right. Something was going on, but nobody exactly knew what the, what the reason was. So my mom and I are talking about it, and we're looking around, and it's daylight. This is a city of 1.2 million people, so it seems normal. You know, it's not, it's not a Wild West. It's not a, it's not a Clint Eastwood movie or whatnot. But, you know, everything that happens at night or you know in a big city can happen anywhere. You don't always like, need to see it. So we are uh, at these apartments, and I remembered from my high school days that there was a, a little corner store, a block down that would sell you individual beers. So my mom and I were thirsty. I said, Hey, mom, I'm gonna get some beers. Got a couple, and on my way back, uh, there were about 44, 45 rounds of AK-47. It was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, I, I, it was two blocks away. And I just remember I, I paused and I thought, first, where's my mom? <laughs> I need to run back and make sure she's okay. So, of course, I did that. Um, and then the journalist and me took over, and I wanted to get right to the scene and see what was going on. And my mom said, give me your gold chain. Give me your watch. Go do your thing. And on the way over there, I just it's, it's interesting because if you guys have been in Ciudad Juarez, there's a, a whitewash message on, on the mountain that says, La Biblia es la verdad, léela, the Bible is the truth, read it. There was a car that was being chased, and eventually the, the assassins got these four men in the car. They were all dead at the scene. 
the car rolled in and stopped at a middle school named after Francisco Villa, Pancho Villa Middle School. Um, it was two blocks away from a place called, uh, a park called uh, La Plaza de, de Periodista. The, it's like the journalist plaza that has statues and plaques to the journalists in Mexico. And I remember as the Mexican Red Cross drove by, they didn't even stop. The cops just said, there's no point. And I realized later that the day before, the cartels had sent a message to the Red Cross saying, if you don't want to become part of the dead, don't help the wounded, because we'll get you too. And then it, it, it hits you when you're there. It's, you know, what is, what is going on? And you start sort of asking questions. And it can be something as simple to Gilberto Antiveros, a.k.a. Greñas, was the capo for the Juarez cartel. He did some time. When he got out, he went to work for the Sinaloa cartel. It could be something as simple as Saul Reyes Gamboa, who was the former police chief in Juarez, getting arrested in El Paso for trying to bribe ICE agents to smuggle loads across. It could be because Chapo Guzman decided, I'm not going to mess with the Gulf Cartel in Nuevo Laredo anymore. I'm going to focus on Juarez. I'm going I'm to try to come east from Sinaloa and take Chihuahua. And uh, journalists and academics and uh, politicians, we can all sit and ask a thousand questions. But what it comes down to is in Juarez alone, years later, it's 11 or 12 or 13,000 people, depending on what statistics you look at. And I, I think what, what gets lost a lot is, y'all you know, picture your, your son or your daughter being born or picture the saddest funeral you ever went to. And that's, that's one person. And when we talk about this drug war, we're talking about thousands. And every time somebody's lowered into the ground, somebody's heart is breaking. And I think that we get so wrapped up in the why and the Second Amendment and the gun running and the prohibition and the, the, that we get, that, that I think that, that gets lost in the coverage. But I was also in Mexico City for the elections recently. And I was walking around at night, and people were waiting to go into nightclubs. During the day, people were sitting at sidewalk cafes. And I remembered thinking, this is the first time that I have been in Mexico since 2007 without doing this every five seconds, without you know, seeing a, a, the federales you know, drive by with their masks and machine gun turrets you know, mounted onto to their trucks. And I was somewhat hopeful. There was a lot of talk about the PRI winning, the PRI going back to the old days. You know, the PRI allegedly started this, Calderon, actually it was President Fox that at the tail end of his administration started the crackdown, Calderon picked it up and ran with it, he's been criticized. But it was a sort of odd balance of emotions thinking, so many thousands and thousands and thousands dead, and what's, what's gonna happen? Do people, are people looking to the PRI again? Are people looking to the person? Are people just looking to find anything good in whichever party it is. And I think uh, Dr. Ainsley is probably the, the, the expert on this, seeing as how he's researched it more. But um, in my brief introduction, I just wanted to give a perspective from a reporter that crunches numbers, that reads press releases, that's, that's sometimes hailed as, as very brave for going over to Mexico for three or four days. And then you know, I, was, I was telling the professor, I can flash a passport and come back to the promised land, you know. The real heroes, I think, are the, are the Mexican journalists that still are able to, every single day of their life, report on these issues, um, let people know what's going on, and they have nowhere to hide. Um, and they're, they're dropping, you know, one at a time, two at a time, three at a time, and this is going on in Central America, this is going on in South America. So I think that when we, when we, when we sit and we read these stories and we have our own opinions, I think it's very very important to realize that these, these are people's lives that we're talking about. We get into the back and forth of why and how and who's to blame. Um, but eventually something has to give and I'm, and I'm hopeful for, for my family and, and for, the, for, the, for my countrymen and for the people in the United States as well that, that are very conflicted about this issue, that something will, will start to change. Um, Ciudad Juarez has been, compared to what it has been, somewhat, somewhat safer. Um, I think there were 38 homicides in in August, which was which is great, you know, considering that there had been three, four thousand a year, you know, in previous years. Um, but then again, we wake up this morning and we read the paper that just in the first five days of September alone, they've already killed, I think, 21 people. So it, it speaks to the unpredictability. You know, I get asked like, "Hey, should I go to Acapulco? Should I go to Puerto Vallarta? Should I go to Nuevo Laredo?" Some pe some places are obvious, like, "No, <laughs> don't go." But even the places that you're not really sure of, you can't ever say with any certainty. Sure, that place is fine because you never know when it's gonna kind of pop up. Um, but um, I'll, I'll 
end there and I'll uh, let Professor Ainsley take it up and hopefully he can give us a better insight on what he sees as the, the future of, of Mexico, which by the way is Texas's number one trading partner and the United States' is number two trading partner overall. That's which I think the economic interests of both sides get lost in the immigration debate and the drug war debate, but that's also something that needs to be um, at least in the back of people's minds when they talk about finger pointing is how much we both rely on each other's countries um, and from state to state. Um, so with that, uh, Professor Ainsley, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Catherine, uh, for inviting me tonight. And thank you, uh, Julian, for uh, sharing with us some of the personal experiences you've had as a reporter and as a citizen of, of El Paso and Mexico and, and the, the, the kind of the experience of, in that very personal way of encountering the violence, which I think is, the point you make is really uh, excellent, that we too readily uh, lose the thread of that sort of intimate element of what's going on every single day in many of these communities. So what um, I'm going to present, though, is a little different uh, from that. That is, uh, I want to talk a little bit about what's going on in Mexico at, at two levels. One is uh, th the work I've been doing over the last three and a half years or so is focused on two dimensions of this issue. One, at one level, I've been looking at what does the Mexican government think it's doing? And I've interviewed uh, a lot of people in the Calderon administration, people in the security cabinet, uh, uh, trying to get them to articulate what it is that their strategy is and what's happened here and what's worked and what's not and why. And the second part of what I've done is that I spent uh, the better part of a year and a half going to what is trying to look at this city, which at the time was the epicenter of this violence, uh, trying to look at it at the level that Julian is just talking about, uh, interviewing people whose lives were really more uh, directly affected by the violence, interviewing people who'd lost their children, people who uh, were working in marginalized communities, trying to help um, intervene in the lives of kids who are forming the ranks of the sicarios that, that Julian is mentioning, uh, or who are playing other roles in the uh, uh, cartel universe because uh, of the fact that there are no other jobs, there are no other opportunities in many of these communities. So I did, <clears throat> in Juarez, uh, I did more of that sort of close to the ground, close to the lives of individuals and families and, and people who are trying to do something about what's going on there. So th those are the two levels of the work I've done. And so I want to start with uh, giving you a little context. And uh, I, I would actually uh, typically walk around, but I, I know we've got audio linked to the camera. So I'm going to stay put for sake of the uh, media situation. But I think it's important to get a sense for the context for how it is that Mexico got to this situation. <clears throat> this gives you, uh, a, a, if you disregard the red uh, arrows here, which are more uh, related to, to flights coming into the US, but, but the uh, uh, yellow arrows through the Caribbean, uh, that's where, uh, 90% of the cocaine entered the United States until the 1990s. <clears throat> um, it, at some point around the mid-1990s, the United States, uh, actually the, the late 1980s, the, the United States uh, uh, made uh, agreements, international agreements that, that allowed U.S. naval forces to interdict uh, vessels coming out of South America and uh, begin to disrupt the flow of, uh, at that time it was uh, marijuana and cocaine primarily, but into the eastern seaboard, which is where most of the drugs came from. Um, <clears throat> that effort was successful. And so this is the first of the uh, strategies and that has a tr profound effect in shaping and creating the power of the Mexican cartels today. That's this uh, interdiction effort. The second it occurs in the mid-1990s when the U.S. government sought to uh, seal the borders, strengthen border defense, and this has gotten even 
more acute since uh, in post 9-11. So as the U.S. sealed the borders, which was the funnel through which most of the drugs were coming into the United States, um, that had a profound effect on things in Mexico, on the strategies that the Mexican cartels used to get drugs into the United States, and, and uh, several things in particular. One is that the cartels started paying their people with product. If you were a, 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 a capo in Juarez and you were making $30,000 a month working for the cartel and, and getting cocaine across to El Paso, suddenly you were being paid $15,000 and $15,000 worth of cocaine. That cocaine was turned into cash by creating a domestic retail drug market in, in Juarez, and the same model has happened all over Mexico. So Mexico historically did not have a major uh, uh, drug problem in terms of consumption. Uh, Mexico was a country through which drugs passed on their way to American markets. And so suddenly in the mid-1990s, um, and, in, and especially post-2000, uh, there's an explosion in drug of, of, uh, of addiction in Mexico, in communities where there's a, a lot of um, you know, drug markets going on. This is really relevant to the violence that we're seeing and the number of deaths we're seeing, as you'll see in a second. Uh, and the third thing is that both of, these, um, both of these strategies then, that are American government strategies or policies, change the dynamic of the drug uh, process, of the drug business. And they single-handedly uh, create uh, the the sort of the, the 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 character of the Mexican cartels. They create these cartels had been around in some form or fashion for a century, you know. Uh, some of them even as family-run businesses in, in border communities, but they merge not as sort of employees who are facilitating the Colombian passage of drugs into the U.S., they emerge as really the key players. And they, in many ways, substitute uh, uh, the Colombians uh, with their own people and their own power and their own influence, and they start generating a tremendous amount of money for themselves. This is what changes the dynamic of what's going on in Mexico. So um, I've really covered most of this, but... Uh, so hold a line in the mid-1990s was one of these really important policy changes that had a, a profound effect. So this is more of a current picture of the flow of drugs, and you can see that uh, they're coming uh, into Mexico from Colombia, from Bolivia, from uh, Guatemala and Central America, and uh, the, the, the meth trade is coming from mostly from China, from India, into the eastern, uh, the western seaboard of Mexico, and then into the U.S. after it's manufactured in Mexico. So uh, it, the whole picture has changed radically in, in really in about a little more than a decade. There's, that also has this uh, change. In the 80s, 1980s, 70s, 80s, uh, 90s, uh, the Mexican power structure, the authority of the state, still really called the shots. You had the cartels and organized crime groups that were involved with and colluding with and paying off government officials. But there was a process through which, in some ways, the cartels were sort of kept in their positions and in their territories by the agreements that were formed and in some way still had to answer to authorities. You know? So uh, a cartel could be, uh, uh, the Mexican army could launch an operation against a cartel that wasn't uh, living up to its agreements and things like that. That paradigm changed with the changes that I was just describing. And in many uh, Mexican states and communities, the, the cartels became the preeminent power, the, Im, the, the force behind the, the, the political face of these communities. And I think the power dynamics really shifted profoundly, primarily as a function of two things. One is the, the, uh, 
the new and um, exponential growth of, of the wealth of these organized crime players, and secondly, the, the weaponry that was now in their hands uh, post-2004. So Felipe Calderón launches the, the drug war in, 2000, in December 2006 when, he, when he's inaugurated as, pre as president. And as most of you probably know, there's a, a Mexican uh, presidents serve one six-year term that's not renewable. Um, prior to the Calderon administration, there were basically, these are the basic cartel structures. There was a Juarez cartel, Gulf cartel, the Tijuana cartel, and the Sinaloa cartel, which is basically this federation, which was a collection of, 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 of groups or alliances and so on. And throughout, uh, prior to uh, Calderon uh, launching this war against the cartels, most of these cartels worked, you know, pretty well together. They had, they had their own territories. Uh, if the Sinaloa people wanted to run drugs through Juarez, you know, they paid the Juarez cartel a percentage, 10%, 15%, uh, and their product was protected as it moved through Juarez cartel territory, et cetera. That was the sort of the standing uh, working arrangement between these cartels. Uh, there were always uh, squabbles. There were always people who were being executed here and there. But in a place like Juarez, for example, up until uh, 2008, those kinds of executions, crime, organized crime-related executions, were sort of uh, done uh, quietly. People were picked up. They were taken to safe houses. They were tortured. They were uh, killed. They were taken out to the desert, and they disappeared. You didn't have uh, a lot of uh, massive violence in the communities themselves. Um, the drug war and, and the Calderon strategy in this war changed that as well. But um, I'll, t I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So. At the time that Calderon takes office, I think it's fair to say that the, the, the major drug cartels controlled most of the border areas, the border states, the, the, uh, the, the way that things operated in those communities, the, the state and municipal law enforcement in those communities, uh, as well as other, like Michoacán and Guerrero and, and, and Jalisco and Sinaloa and places like that. But especially along the border, it, it was, it was uh, 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 fist and glove, the way in which uh, the cartels worked in terms of law enforcement, for example. Uh, there's no one who will tell you that the law enforcement was not owned and run by the cartel. They were the armed wing of the cartels. So uh, this is Calderon uh, at the time that he, he makes this declaration of war. Um, Never in the history of modern Mexico since the revolution have you ever seen a Mexican president don military garb like this. This was unprecedented, and it was a real statement of where he was going. So we're going to talk about the current violence. Um, the, the tallies are, uh, the numbers are really slippery. Let me just say that. But these are the official uh, Mexican government figures that say through September of 2011, that is as of a year ago, there were about 48,000 people who'd been killed throughout Mexico between 2007 and September 2011. There are no official government figures in the last year. They have sort of shut down the uh, documentation of this, uh, you know, and, and the reasons are probably not, I, I'm certain they have to do with the election and, and trying to sort of uh, stem the, the, uh, the, 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 the attitudes and, and the, the, the feelings in Mexico, throughout Mexico, about the number of dead, the violence in all of these communities, and so on. So um, the figure I use is, um, let's see if I've got it here, is somewhere between 55,000 and 60,000. 
I think that's a fairly widely accepted uh, figure. There's some people who are saying 100,000, 150,000 today. They're citing figures from the, the, the National Census of uh, uh, Mexican uh, Bureau. But, but those figures include all deaths, not only supposedly organized crime-related deaths. But let me say this, that you know, I spent a lot of time in Juarez. I went, I saw lots of crime scenes and talked to a lot of people. And th among this 55 to 60,000 number are lots of people, I think, who are assassinated because they don't pay the extortion fees that are being de demanded of them and things of that sort. So uh, this 55,000 to 60,000 number, which I think is probably certainly in the ballpark, but it, it, it's victims of organized crime. A percentage of those are, P, are, are organized crime groups killing each other off, and a percentage of those are victims of organized crime. But it's really hard to tease those out, and I'll tell you a little bit more about why that's the case in a second. These are the most violent states for 2011, January through September that we have. Uh, it's changed a little bit uh, uh, this year and other years. You know, so, so, but the top uh, states on this list have been sort of uh, high violent states consistently for years now. Chihuahua always leading the pack by a significant margin. So these numbers kind of capture that. Um, this map is a little out of date. Coahuila uh, between Chihuahua and Nuevo Leon has had a lot of violence. Uh, Tijuana, Baja California, a lot less. Uh, Jalisco has more violence. Uh, Veracruz has gone up and so on. So it's not exactly up to date. I apologize for that. But, but just to give you a sense for uh, uh, the, the sort of the spectrum there. So I'm talking to these uh, Mexican government people and I'm asking them sort of a consistent question is, you know, what's the strategy here? What are you, what are you all doing and, and how are you going about doing this and why? So the first uh, shocked me, really, when I had uh, the head of CISEN, which is like the Mexican CIA, tell me that uh, our strategy uh, consists, first of all, in recovering territory from the cartels. And what shocked me about that is, to me, it seemed like a concession of the degree of control and influence that the cartels and organized crime had in broad swaths of Mexico. The second key plank for the Mexican officials is th what they call uh, this uh, uh, infelicitous term, perhaps, uh, disarticulation. Uh, of DTOs, drug trafficking organizations, by which they mean the killing or the arrest of the leaders of the cartels. And finally, uh, they talk about strengthening institutions, law enforcement and the judiciary. Those are the key planks of the Mexican government. They've been the key planks from the beginning of this war, and they are still things that uh, Calderon is referencing in his State of the Union speech last week, okay? And we'll come back uh, at the end to sort of analyze some of these. But so the first problem that they run into is a real obvious one, which, I, which I'm calling boots on the ground problem. So the Mexican government launches this war, in quotes, but it's not really in quotes. Uh, we know that in, in most of these border states, just for example, let's just take Chihuahua. We know that the state and the municipal police forces in that state are run lock, stock, and barrel by the cartels. Um, so how are you going to take down or dismantle or disarticulate or whatever the euphemism is that you want to use? How are you going to go into these states and, and, and alter that situation? You can't rely on local law enforcement. You don't have anybody to help you do this in that, in, at that level. Secondly, the Mexican Federal Police at, in 2007 uh, consists of 6,500 uh, officers. The AFI, the so-called Mexican FBI, 6,000 people, 
12,500 federal law enforcement altogether. And I just give you this figure by comparison. There's 80,000 police in Mexico City alone. 12,500 officers, assuming that these people are not in collusion with some of what's going on, are, are really uh, just not an adequate tool for this purpose. So Calderon makes the decision that the only uh, alternative he has is to deploy the army. Meanwhile, he's, he, he launches a, a massive campaign to build up the Mexican federal police. So uh, I want to take you uh, to Juarez for a second and talk a little bit more about what's taking place there because uh, Juarez becomes basically the epicenter of this struggle and it becomes the testing ground for the Mexican government's policies. Um, and so in 2008, the Sinaloa cartel basically, as Julian was, was referencing, pulls out of Laredo, Nuevo Laredo, and starts moving into uh, Chihuahua, and, and uh, um, Juarez in particular. They start actually in 2007, they start infiltrating their people, they start, they've already, they know all these people, they've worked with a lot of these people, they start uh, what they call in Mexico, uh, levantando, they start picking up people, disappearing them, torturing them, getting information about who's holding what positions, which police are working with what uh, uh, groups, et cetera, et cetera. And by 2008, the, the Sinaloa cartel is ready to actually launch the assault on Juarez. And um, so that's why Juarez becomes so important and, and becomes head and shoulders above any other community in Mexico or Latin America for that matter in terms of, of the level of violence. It's actually a very uh, beautiful town in many ways. So to also understand the violence, you need to understand something about the structure of these cartels. And, and the, this is the, the basic Juarez cartel model. The setas are a little different than this. But um, basically, in, in the, the way the Juarez cartel worked is that they had their top echelon people. Then they have their armed wing, which was the municipal police and the state police, La Línea, they were called. And then at the bottom, they had local gangs and the subsidiaries of these local gangs who were managing the retail drug markets at the street level. So those are the three tiers within. This is uh, a Barrio Azteca or Aztecas in, in Juarez, uh, one of the Juarez cartel street gangs who, who um, con control, manage the, the retail drug markets. This gives you a, a sense of the uh, explosion uh, uh, of uh, violence in Juarez. In 2008, that's a typo. That's uh, 1,621. It's not 162. In 2008 is when it explodes. And you can just see 2009, 10, 11. Um, you know, I think it was just a week or two that we w learned that uh, the in, in Afghanistan we had lost the 2,000th fatality, U.S. military fatality. And that's over the course, that's, that's uh, a full-blown declared war over the course of 10 or 11 years. Uh, and what is there were more people than that dying every year for several years. So it just gives you a sense for the scale of the violence that was being visited on this city. Uh, these are uh, some of the uh, scenes that um, I encountered. This, this was uh, a family who uh, owned a, a key uh, um, shop that made keys for people. And uh, I was told that, that they didn't pay the, the quota. And uh, one of the things that, that these cartels have done, and, and really this is more at the level of, depending on, on the, uh, the, the, the community in, in Juarez and, and depending on the, the amount of money you're talking about, but the, st the street level gangs uh, are extorting businesses and individuals in a rampant way uh, all over town. And so that's why I say that it's really unclear how many of these fatalities are specifically drug-related people as opposed to sort of victims of this kind of organized crime. But the, what strikes 
me and I, what I hope strikes you is like you look at these children. This is an execution in broad daylight. Uh, there's no, no one in Juarez who has not been directly affected by this violence. There's no community that's been spared. It doesn't matter if you live in the wealthiest enclaves uh, or the poorest of neighborhoods. Everybody in Juarez has seen the violence firsthand, has felt it in terms of family members and so on. And uh, this is an execution of a police commander. And you can really see the discipline of, of the high, higher level sicarios in, uh, that that can pull off an execution like this. This isn't some 18-year-old kid with an AK-47 who's just uh, firing wild shots at people. This is an execution in front of a school that uh, I, I was one of the most uh, haunting uh, of, of the ones that I saw. Um, this kid, this is the same execution. This kid's arriving at school and you can see the, the victim behind him. So he's going to have to go under this crime scene tape and go to the right. These two young women here are coming to school, too. So this is the kind of stuff that people are living every day in Juarez. So uh, in 2009, the, the Mexican government is, uh, launches really uh, a, a massive infusion of, of federal forces to, to, to try to stem the, the violence. 10,000 uh, army um, and um, all of, you know, they disbanded the police. They had done several efforts to clean up the Juarez police force. They, they were all uh, ineffective, so they finally just disbanded the entire force. The army starts patrolling the streets, and these people in red are forensics people, and their faces are covered because they're afraid of being identified and being killed. The, the, uh, in, in May of 2010, then the, the federal police, now a much more robust force, comes in and, and uh, replaces the army, sets up roadblocks all over the city. Uh, uh, there are a lot of problems with all of this that we'll talk about in a minute. So I want to sort of come back to, to sort of break down the Mexican government's strategy and look at, at, at what's happened and what's not. In terms of recovering territory from the cartels, uh, the violence, is, if you follow the news, has is, is, is spread to a lot of new communities, for example, that, that uh, like Veracruz, that historically did not have a lot of violence, but suddenly it's, it's rife with uh, cartel violence. Uh, Nuevo, Nuevo León, you all have probably heard the story that Monterey was one of the safest cities in all of Mexico, and in less than a year, it's, it sort of becomes uh, really terrorized by the violence. Um, in all of these communities where, where this violence is taking place, you've got a, a, a really a horrific dynamic taking place because the citizens in these communities are absolutely uh, vulnerable and they have nowhere to turn. They don't trust the authorities. They don't trust any of the authorities. And this is partly a function of, you know, decades, a century of being abused and violated and, and um, uh, uh, having your own authorities turn on you and exploit you. And it's also a function of the fact that uh, the authorities that even have an interest in doing something constructive and useful, which I actually believe there are people who have those intentions, they're not being sufficiently efficient. They can't protect these communities. I interviewed a woman who uh, works at a maquiladora in Juarez. She makes about 400 pesos a week, and she has to pay the neighborhood gangs 100 pesos a week for safe transit to and from her bus to work. This woman is like 60 years old, uh, lives by herself, completely at the mercy of the gangs in her neighborhood. There is nowhere for her to turn. Uh, so this is the kind of stuff that, that's taking place. And so I think it's the, the, the recovery of territory strategy has clearly not worked. Um, 
and it it, it cost Calderón dearly at the elect in the polls. Obviously, his his party lost not only the presidency but a lot of political power. In terms of the the disarticulation of the the drug trafficking organizations. Actually, I think at this level, the, the, the Mexican government strategy has been more successful than they've been given credit for. I mean, there's a lot of people, like this is uh, La Barbie, a sort of infamous guy, uh, that they have taken down. A lot of people who've been arrested, uh, as I note here, 22 of the 37 most wanted, on Mexico's most wanted list have been taken down. Uh, of the original cartels, a lot of these cartels have been severely weakened. The Tijuana cartel is shadow of itself. The Gulf cartel basically displaced by the Setas and pushed out. La Familia severely weakened, atomized. The Juarez cartel, most people think, is a shadow of its former self. Beltran, Leyva cartels, a lot of that leadership has been taken down. Uh, a lot of these mid-level uh, capos have also been arrested or killed each other off or whatever. What we've had also, though, is a kind of, so that, that's, that's created a tremendous amount of violence. And at the same time that we have this sort of atomizing of the whole uh, violence structure, we've also got uh, the consolidation of power. It's, it's kind of a paradox here. But the Sinaloa and the Setas, I think, are emerging as the two most powerful cartels in Mexico without question. And so this is uh, an image of sort of the distribution of cartel influence uh, in early on in this war. And this is uh, a, a more contemporary image and with the blue being the Sinaloa cartel and the red being the Setas. Um, they're, they're sort of rough images, but basically you can tell, tell that the Setas basically control the eastern seaboard, those eastern border states, and the Setas and the Sinaloa controls the western s side of things. In terms of strengthening institutions, law enforcement, uh, the Mexican federal police is much more stronger, much more professionalized. Um, it's a much more robust force. There's uh, a lot of them are college educated. Um, I think that there's been a tremendous amount of it invested in the Mexican federal police, and they have worked very closely with the U.S. law enforcement, and there's a lot of, um, un until the recent uh, Cuernavaca CIA debacle, <laughs> there was uh, a lot of cooperation and, and, um, and collaboration between them. Not to set aside, though, the fact that there are, have been, a, 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 at the same time, uh, some consistent uh, symptoms of, of, of deep structural problems. You may have heard that in the Mexico City airport that the Mexican federal police sort of control. Uh, there was they, uh, two officers killed uh, uh, some of their colleagues. It was involving uh, their uh, management of, of drugs flying in from South America. In Juarez, uh, uh, there was a literally a rebellion of, of, a, of, a, of a group of uh, something like 200 uh, federal uh, police against their commander. They actually called the media and said, these guys are picking up people, they're extorting them, they're planting drugs on them, uh, they, uh, and, and they, they dragged them out of their housing uh, quarters, and, and the, if, you know, four of those commanders were, were, uh, were imprisoned. So, so it's, I'm, I'm not saying that, that uh, this is an ideal situation, but I'm just saying that compared to anything Mexico has had in the past, it's much better, but there are lots of problems remaining. State, uh, municipal, state and municipal police, still highly problematic. It's been very difficult to clean up these police forces at the state and municipal level. Um, in terms of the institutional uh, uh, strategy. The judicial system remains highly problematic. And I think uh, my own opinion is that this is the Achilles heel of the entire enterprise. If you don't have a judicial system that works, there's no way that you can have any kind of an effective um, in interference with the operations of, of criminals of any sort. Uh, and it, it, it's uh, 
I think it's, it's the Mexican uh, Congress should be ashamed of itself. Uh, there have been uh, calls for judicial reform going back uh, a long time. You may remember the million uh, person march in 2004 in Mexico City where it was the largest outpouring of citizens in the history of Mexico, not counting the Mexican Revolution. They had one demand. We want to clean up the police. We want judicial reform. And so uh, that, that continues. Uh, most crimes aren't reported because people, don't, be, people know nothing will happen. Uh, but this is the really problematic statistic. Only 1% to 2% of crimes get solved in Mexico. So if you have a uh, uh, city like Juarez where there's been almost 11,000 murders and there's only been about 200 people processed and imprisoned for those murders, that tells you the degree of impunity that people have. You, unless you're caught red-handed in front of somebody committing a crime, any kind of crime, I'm not talking about just cartel-related crime, uh, the chances of you having any sort of consequence are almost nil. So there is no investigation still after almost 20 years of, of appeals. So this is a, a protest at, at the University of Juarez uh, uh, based on this same issue. I think this also creates, it's part of the, the, the reason why there's so many human rights abuses related to this effort. Number one, you have an army that has no training in law enforcement work. So what they're trained to do is to go in and kick ass and torture people to get information. That's what all of the police forces historically know to do. And if you don't have a system that trains uh, police to investigate crimes, and if you don't have a judicial system that takes those criminals and the evidence that's been gathered and processes it in some sort of standard, transparent way, then you don't have a system that's going to work. And that's exactly what is going on in Mexico. And it, I think it, it, it helps produce the, the human rights violations because when a what is municipal police officer picks up somebody on the street, the only thought that person has about how to, to get to, quote unquote, the truth, even if they're intent on getting the truth, is basically to take this person down into one of those cells and beat them up and keep them separated from their families and contact from, with other people until they tell you what you think they need to be telling you. That's the standard investigative tool. It's been the tool for decades, most of a century. And for all of the talk about judicial reform in Mexico, it, it is uh, going at a snail's pace, and that should be the first priority of the government. So um, I'm going to try to wrap up here. Uh, but in terms of the issue of failed state, which comes up occasionally, uh, I, I, I don't think you can call Mexico as a country a failed state. I think that's really off the mark. But there's no question that there are areas in numerous states that are failed areas, failed, uh, that, there are, that there are failed states, in fact. I, I would say Tamaulipas is a failed state. There are most of the places in that state have no, no rule of law. In Chihuahua, there are many communities that don't, don't have mayors, they don't have police chiefs, they don't have police forces because they've either been killed or they've fled. The only people who, are, who have any sway in those communities are the organized crime groups. So to me, those, that's the definition of a failed state. When a, when a government cannot provide its citizens with basic protections and safety and recourse, you have a failed state. When Workers going to work have to pay the local gangs a fee to not be beat up or kidnapped or killed. That's a failed neighborhood. Um, massive problems with the media. I mean, Julian uh, uh, mentioned that. Uh, many journalists are being killed 
Many journalists are uh, fear for their lives. Many have thought exile. We've got a massive problem. That, that's another sort of symptom of a failed state, right? When, when people whose job it is to inform us about what's going on are not allowed for fear of their lives to communicate what they know and what they see. When in Nuevo Laredo, a journalist uh, uses Twitter to communicate something and she's tracked down and brutally killed, you don't have a functioning civil process. You know, you've got a failed state. Dozens of mayors have been uh, executed in Mexico. The, the, uh, the gubernatorial candidate in the 2010 elections in Tamaulipas assassinated in broad daylight on a campaign tour at uh, you know, 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. And the violence in a lot of these communities continues. So, um, and, and one thing that's not reported is that in these same areas, the ancillary crime has just exploded. So, you know, we talk about the drug war, but what we don't hear a lot about is the fact that a lot of the violence is taking place between people who aren't cartel members, uh, you know, they're not involved in the, at that level of, of uh, organized crime. They're local uh, gang members who are uh, killing each other, who uh, go into homes and, and beat up and torture and rape and, and maim people who don't do what they want them to do, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, there's a lot of extortion going on in, in these states especially, but in lots of places. There's a lot of kidnappings. The, the, and the cartels are also involved in that in, in terms of cha changing their business model to try to find other sources of income. But, but they are not the only problem with this. And so the Mexican government faces a daunting challenge of dealing not only with the drug cartel organized crime dimension of what's going on, but also just ordinary crime in communities where there are no, no institutions that, that, that help protect people. Um, uh, most of this, uh, I'm just gonna uh, kind of run through this. Uh, I think you're probably aware of all of this, uh, but the amount of profits that are being generated by US drug consumption are enormous. Um, uh, the uh, the DEA says, uh, you know, a couple of years ago was saying 250 cities. You know, you can get drugs in any American city. And so anybody in those cities who's responsible for getting the drugs to their consumer has some link to Mexican cartels. I mean, that's just obvious. Uh, a huge problem that's, that's the unmentionable, that's the you can't, if you're a politician, you can't touch this with a 10-foot pole, uh, is the, the, uh, the assault weapons ban. And letting that lapse has armed the cartels uh, and is um, a big part of the scale of the violence. Uh, and Plan Merida, I think, is, is so pathetic, so anemic in relation to the nature of the problem. We spend more than this $1.6 billion a week in Afghanistan. This is an outrage. Every American should be outraged in terms of what's going on in Mexico and should be uh, doing something about it. You know, uh, Julian mentioned uh, the second most important trading partner to the U.S. It's, they typically say third, but that's because they're, they're counting uh, the amount of Chinese products that we buy, you know, but if you're looking at who's buying American products, Mexico is the second most important. Um, a tremendous amount of, of uh, economic relationships and <coughs> family, community, cultural relationships. So this is, a ma this is what makes na something national security. This is a national security problem. Uh, and... Um, it's not getting the attention it deserves, um, uh, Tijuana, for you. Um, so uh, there's some evidence that the violence has actually peaked in Mexico. Um, the data for the first six months of 2012 compared to 2011 uh, suggest that homicides, for example, are down 8%. This is the first time in five or six years. 
In Tijuana, the violence has dropped 42 percent since 2008. Remember that Tijuana was the Juarez in 2008. Tijuana was the Nuevo Laredo in 2008. A lot of people were being killed. Journalists were being killed. A lot of people being kidnapped. So, uh, and and what they did in, in Tijuana is that they uh, they they. As they did in, in Juarez, they fired all the police. The, the federal police came in and tried to rebuild the police, et cetera. In Juarez, uh, as, as Julian mentioned, homicides are down almost 60% over last year. Um, and these, are, these are the figures for uh, July and August, although, as Julian mentions, we've, we've seen a spike in the first uh, week of September. Uh, but still, I mean, these numbers are so... Uh, there were weekends in Juarez that, you know, 34 people were killed, many. So uh, to have a whole month of thir 34 people is like people are, like, astounded, you know. And there's other evidence in, in, in Juarez, you know. Uh, uh, in, uh, the tax receipts are up. Real estate uh, prices are beginning to, to move up and people are buying houses and stuff like that. So there's, for the first time since, since 2008, there's some evidence that the economy, people are going out and spending money and so on. Um, and we can talk about why that might, why, why that's happened if, if you care to, but uh, I also want to put this in perspective uh, that uh, while there are areas in Mexico and cities in Mexico that have a tremendous amount of violence and a very scary places to go. If you look at it uh, in comparison to some other uh, uh, Western Hemisphere uh, countries, it's really um, Mexico is sort of at the median of, of something like, well, how many countries are there in Western Hemisphere, like 40 or? Um, Peña Nieto is going to have to He's got a big job on his hands. First of all, he's got to convince people he's not going back to the pre of old. Secondly, uh, there's tremendous pressure on him to put a stop to the violence. And he's going to, if, if he's able to do that, he's going to have to do it in a way that doesn't uh, uh, reinforce the perception that a lot of people have that if he does it, it's going to be because he's, the pre has made deals with some of the cartels. Uh, the U.S. government is going to put tremendous pressure on him as well. Uh, uh, the amount of cooperation between U.S. And, and Mexican law enforcement and intelligence people, uh, you, you, you would have never, prior to Calderon, you would have never had a situation where two CIA people are driving in an armored embassy vehicle with a Mexican uh, military person, uh, this kind of situation, it's, it's, the, it's really new. So, uh, and I think achieving real judicial reform is going to be a real challenge. I always like to end with this because uh, this is a neighborhood picture I took in Juarez, and a very hard scrabble, very beat up neighborhood, lots of dead people, and most of the dead are the ages of these kids. Most of the dead are between 15 and 25. And so uh, I'd, I'd actually just left a cemetery with a friend who uh, visiting uh, the plot of somebody who had died uh, and uh, died of, actually died of natural causes, not uh, narco-related uh, death. But, but I heard this, uh, this sound coming from this house down the street and I, so he stopped and said, what are you guys doing? And, and they said, we're getting ready for the party tonight. And I said, what? You know, party in what is This is 2010. I mean, there's people dying every minute in this city, you know. And they played a couple of tunes and, you know, they were so vibrant and so alive. And so um, they still have a, a kind of a, 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 an innocence. And, and I think this is really what at the end of the day is going to save Mexico, you know, these, these kids. So, um, so that's it. Um, glad to entertain questions, uh, anything that uh, wasn't clear, anything you, you don't agree with or are curious about.
Mm -hmm. Will her assassination have any impact on Mexico? You know, I, I doubt it because the thing is that there are lots of people producing drugs in Colombia, Bolivia, Peru, uh, and so I, I suspect that somebody else will just step up, you know? Yeah. Now, what about uh, the Mexican Congress? What portion of the Congress is controlled by the cartels? <laughs> that, well, and, and let's not forget there weren't, that weren't the cartels are not the only problem in the Mexican Congress, you know? I mean, this is a highly dysfunctional... I mean, we think the, the American uh, scenario is dysfunctional right now. Well, it is. The, well, it is. You're right. But, but uh, this is um, in a different league, you know? If you look at... You go on YouTube and look at some of these sessions, people are just completely nuts, you know, and, uh, but, so, it, 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 the, the real question is how much corruption, and, you know, a percentage of that corruption is cartel-driven, I mean, certainly the cartels in terms of judicial reform, for example, have a tremendous investment in the status quo, keeping it the way it is. They don't want a judiciary that works, they don't want, uh, a, a relationship between law enforcement and the courts that's functional and that's transparent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's not in their interest, you know. So, but then also other people who are involved in other kinds of corruption, it isn't in their interest either. So there's a real collusion there. So, you know, I, I, I don't have a number, but it's a, it's a huge problem. Yeah. What do you think is turning around in the uh, Well, I think several things. You know, the, the, if you go, if you ask people in Juarez, uh, there's one answer they'll give you, uh, and that is that the Sinaloa cartel won. They've wiped out the Juarez cartel, they're calling the shots, and anybody who, who was in their way has mostly been removed. That's, that's the standard party line. Uh, you know, that's also a very cynical view. Uh, that, that, and I'm going to, I'm probably a lone voice in this, you know, but uh, here's how I see it, you know, and, and it's probably sort of the standard, what's that, what's that uh, aphorism that in, uh, success has uh, many mothers or whatever it is? Uh, look, the Mexican federal government sent 12,000 army and federal police into Juarez in 2009 and 2010. That's about 25% of the total troops that they deployed. They took down a lot of people. There's no question about it. That's one thing. Secondly, in, 2000, in the spring of 2010, the Mexican government launched a, what they call a tejido social intervention, a, a social fabric intervention. Up until this point, the Mexican government had, had nothing but strict old school law enforcement come in, pick people up, vans with lots of armed people, breaking down doors, hauling people off. They invested, along with help from US AID and the Inter-American Bank and the World Bank and so on, they invested a quarter of a billion dollars in social programs, building schools, um, child care, uh, building child care centers, unemployment uh, interventions, addictions interventions, uh, building hospitals. That money was exclusively used to, uh, to address the social fabric problems, which were huge in Juarez. I mean, you know, that's a whole other talk, but they were, they were and in many ways they continue to be. But a percentage of the change, I think, must be related to that unprecedented infusion in efforts to repair some of the social conditions that breed violence, breed desperation, that have kids like those I just showed you with no schools to go to, with nothing to do but maybe a maquiladora job, which is mostly hiring young women and pays not enough to get you through the month, you know? So that's, 
that's got that's so some kind of law enforcement issue the the uh, the the impact of this huge again unprecedented investment in the social fabric the u.s economy what is lost something like 80,000 jobs in a short period of time because half of the maquiladoras in Juarez build parts for the U.S. auto industry. We know where that industry was in 2008. It was on the verge of bankruptcy. So nobody's buying cars. These maquiladoras are all shutting down. Even those people who are making not much money no longer have a job, no longer have a way of putting food on the table. So when the U.S. economy starts getting traction, a lot of that unemployment is reabsorbed. I think that's another variable that people don't really talk about, but I think that's a big piece of it, too. So I think it's things like that. Yeah. What are the realistic um, projections of the impact if the United States changed a couple laws? If the United States did change their drug laws um, so that uh, legalizing can make it, try and take out their criminal element on this side of the border, that's one area. The other is, I'm not sure if the stats are true, but I've heard an incredible amount of weapons that actually flow from the U.S. to there. Um, maybe there'd just be other ways to get there. But from what no. else on the impact of those two areas, what would it take and how long would it, would it take for, for positive impact? Yeah. Well, let me start with a second. And I, I, let me say, I think it's unconscionable that we allow people to buy combat weapons, automatic assault weapons, and they don't even have to show an ID. You know, we, we don't track, we're not allowed to track even basic purchases of those kinds of weapons. And it's absolutely documented fact that those are the weapons that are being used in Mexico by the hundreds of thousands. So that's got to stop. But we don't have the political will to even have a national dialogue about that. You know, people are so terrified of raising some sort of Second Amendment something. We had an assault weapons ban. And it wasn't until it lapsed, until it was allowed to lapse, that we had, you know, this huge explosion in, in uh, the use of these weapons in Mexico. People, uh, cops as well as criminals in Mexico were using, you know, they had their 38 revolvers and their whatever, but they, nobody had assault weapons. In Mexico, they're called weapons for the exclusive use of the army because the army is the only force in Mexico that had those kinds of weapons. And so that's huge. In terms of the, the other question, yeah, that's another conversation that we have a very difficult time with. You know, uh, it, it's obvious you take the money out of this business, it would, that's what would bring it to a stop. That's, actually, that's the only thing that will bring it to the stop. I mean, we've, we've had this war on drugs for decades, and it's done nothing. Nothing. So it, it, any kid in, at Austin High School can tell you where to get anything you want. And that's not just true in Austin, that's true anywhere. So it's an utter failure, but we don't seem to have the political will to look it in the eye and say, okay, what are the tough choices here? If we legalize drugs, it's going to take all the wind out of the sails. It's also going to produce a lot of addicts. Have you ever seen somebody who's addicted to meth? Somebody who's addicted to uh, crack. We, we, we do, shouldn't kid ourselves. There's no easy solution to this thing. But it, we would take a tenth of the money that we're spending on this other effort to try to address these issues through rehabilitation centers, tr drug treatment, education, et cetera, et cetera, prevention programs would cost a lot less, and you're still getting these addicts anyway, but. One other ask, to follow mm. up on that, so I'm talking about culture. Um, have you done any, any studies of the gang culture and how that's going to transfer to the United States? 
to understand what's happening in a lot of communities throughout the United States of influences um, and with the schools, et cetera. So have you, have you seen any um, associations? Uh, in Mexico, you mean? Uh, from the, 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 like the drug cartels and the gangs, the culture from Mexico. Coming to the States? Right. Well, I don't have any personal experience with that. I mean, the the reports I read say that that yeah, local in, in every community there are local gangs that are running this show for. The, it's a business relationship that they have with these cartels, and you know a lot of them are gangs that start in prison and then continue doing what they do. You know, so yes. Nationalized currently. I mean, it goes on and off. And, mm-hmm. and you know, what do you see going on there versus uh, the world oil culture and balancing all that with OPEC and Venezuela and the U.S.? You know, I'm not an expert on that, but what I do know is, uh, look, I'm in Mexico City um, three weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Reforma, the the leading newspaper, in Mexico City, front page story. They have a reporter drive uh, in San Luis Potosí between two points. In that, I don't know, it's like a 50-mile stretch. They count something like 32, sorry about that, 32 little thatch hut places where people have barrels of gasoline that they are you know, selling to put into your car for like 35, 40% less than if you went to a, 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 a state gas station. I mean, you know, the, so there's, the, the, the Pemex is so thoroughly saturated with corruption. That's one problem. And it is still nationalized and it's been nationalized since the 30s. Uh, it's a huge problem, it, you know, Pet- El Petróleo es Nuestro was a was a rallying call in Mexico in the 30s, you know, and and so there's a tremendous amount of pride in the idea of that that Mexico owns the the oil industry, but beneath that the the sort of the facade of that nationalism is a real crisis, and uh, you know Calderón announces that they found all of this oil off of uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, et cetera, but. Uh, you know, if you've got uh, uh, this, this BEMEC system is, you know, and, and also the Mexican government has been feeding off of BEMEX, you know, using it to underwrite its, uh, its own expenses. And so it, it, it's, it's really um, a huge problem. If they could fix that, it, it would do a lot for the Mexican economy. Are you all ready to go see Barack or, uh, or you're, you know, uh, well, thank you very much. Enjoyed being with you and uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh.